sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Am I disturbing you? I hope not. I don't mean to intrude. I just dropped in for half an hour with a story. It's not an ordinary story, and yet it might easily happen to someone you know. Someone you may have heard of. In any case, I'm pretty certain you'll be glad you listened. But perhaps I'd better introduce myself again, although we have met before. You don't remember? <laughs> oh, come now. We're old friends. You must have seen my face on your wrist, in your pocket, or on that steeple over there where I suppose I have more dignity but much less fun. Yes, we've met before, and we'll meet again, I'm sure of that. You see, I get around. Sooner or later, I run into everyone. Sooner or later, everyone runs into me. But I was telling you about my story, which has to do with Jeannie Clare. Jeannie's a pretty girl of 23 and rather nice. She had a birthday just a month ago, and it was a very happy affair. Some of the girls who worked with Jeannie at Kane's department store threw the party, and they all had a wonderful time. But that was a month ago, and things are different now. Precinct police stations are not exactly pleasant places, especially for girls like Jeannie Clare. The desk sergeant's always impersonal and efficient, but sometimes even efficiency can be a frightening thing. How long will it take, Sergeant? Oh, about 20 minutes. As long as it takes him to get down and back. 20 minutes? Mm, 20 minutes. In the meantime, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Now, Jeannie Clare, level 48, is that right? That's right. Now, what's your age? 23. Blue eyes... Brown hair. Hi. Five feet two. Wait. One hundred and ten pounds without my shoes. Mm-hmm. One hundred and ten. Married? No. No, I'm not married. Mm. Occupation? Occupation. Yeah, where, where, where do you work? At Kane's department store. I sell gloves, men's gloves. That's where it started, at Kane's. Yes, that's where it started, at Kane's. It had been a long, long afternoon behind the counter, and the girls were glad to hear the closing bell. Oh, saved by the bell. I was just ready to pass out with exhaustion. Oh, my feet are killing me, Jeannie. You make out your sales tally, Ethel. Oh, you think I got eight hands like an octopus? Oh, I'm just starting now, and I better hurry. I got a date with Harry. Huh? Oh? Oh, uh, you, you want to come along? With you and Harry? Yeah, he could get another guy. Oh, thanks, Ethel, but not tonight. Why, what goes with you? Don't you ever want to have any fun? I like my fun, same as anyone else. Only, well, not tonight, Ethel. Not tonight, not tomorrow night, not next month. Are you waiting for the perfect man? Maybe. Ah, oh, there ain't no such animal. Oh, but you can't be too particular, Jeannie, unless you want to sell gloves for old man Martin for the rest of your life. You take Harry, for instance. He's no Van Johnson, but he's got his points. Harry's nice, but he's not my type. Now, who is your type, that Johnson dream? I'm not interested so much in looks as I am in character. I want to marry a man, Ethel, a human being, not a collar ad. Oh, what do you think Harry is, a horse? <laughs> you don't know what I mean. You see, Ethel, I never had much education. So my man's got to be smart. He's got to have manners, too, smart manners. Like they have in France. He won't look silly, for instance, when he kisses my hand. <laughs> what else? He'll dress in taste. Not like a clothes horse, but like a gentleman. He'll be interested in good books and classical music. He'll take me to the art galleries and explain what the pictures mean. And when he talks, his voice will be soft and gentle. And clever. Like a man of the world. I beg your pardon? Uh, what? Uh, may I see those gloves, please? They're on the first shelf. I'm sorry, mister. The store's closed. Oh, that's too bad. It's, it's all right, Ethel. I'll open up my book again and, and take care of the gentleman. No, it's your time. <laughs> that's awfully kind of you. I, I hope I'm not putting you to too much trouble. No. No trouble at all. Is something wrong? Uh, wrong? The way you stare at me. My tie? Oh, excuse me. I, 
I was just thinking of something. <laughs> Are these the gloves you mean? Uh, yes, please. Seven ninety eight plus tax. Right, well, extremely smart. Yeah, they're good looking, all right. What is your size? Eight and a half. These ought to fit. May I try them on? Oh, sure. And take your time. I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry at all. Jeannie could hardly believe it. There he was, the man she'd always dreamed about, standing right in front of her. He wasn't handsome, but he was tall. And his clothes were neat. Jeannie always used to think a derby hat was rather silly on a man, but on this one, it was different. Everything seemed so different about him. And his voice. Well, when Jeannie heard his voice, the picture was complete. And what a wonderful picture it was. But then Jeannie remembered that he'd buy his gloves, he'd pay for them, and she'd never see him again. She tried to think of something to say to keep him there. But he only smiled politely, made his purchase, and walked away. And Jeannie felt she was watching him walk right out of her life. Jeannie! Huh? Hey, what are you dreaming about? I... Nothing. Did you make the sale? Yeah. Yeah, I made the sale. Hey, look! He forgot his wallet! Wallet? Yeah, on the counter over here. Oh, I'll take care of it. Give it to me. Hey, hey, what's your hurry? Uh, see if it's got any identification. Well, well there's a card in here and a license. Mm -hmm. His name is Courtney. Keith Courtney. Huh? Pretty fancy. You better turn that over to the section manager. Oh, it's all right, Ethel. I can handle it. Why? Oh, just to make sure he gets it, I'll, uh, I'll deliver it myself. The young man's address was in the 40s, a small hotel. Not an elegant place, Jeannie thought, but dignified. She waited in the lobby while the desk clerk called his room. It only took him two minutes to come down, but sometimes two short minutes can seem like two long years. Good evening. You, you remember me? <laughs> of course. You are the charming young lady who waited on me in the store. <laughs> You're kind of absent-minded, aren't you? I am. You left this wallet on the counter. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I thought I'd lost it. You know, that's happened to me once before. I really should be more careful. You really should. There wasn't much money in it, but uh, there were the pictures. Of my family, you see. I would have hated to lose those snapshots. Well, you got them back now. So I guess I'll go... Uh, no, just, just a minute, please. You, you've gone to a great deal of trouble to return this to me. Oh, that's all right. When one returns a wallet, there's usually a reward. Well, in this case, we might reverse the procedure. I don't get it. I'd reap the reward myself if you'd have dinner with me. Or have you made a previous appointment? Oh, no, I... I haven't got anything much to do. Then you'll accept? Oh, Sure. I mean, how oh, sure. He took Jeannie to a little Italian place on 46th. But Jeannie could hardly think of food. She just kept listening to his voice and watching him smile as he told her all about himself and about his work. He wanted to be an actor, or, oh, ever since he could remember. And he was looking for a break. He didn't want to be a movie star and make a lot of money. Shakespeare and Ibsen were more his style. He said right now he wasn't working. He was at liberty and available for the right part. Jeannie crossed her fingers and hoped that he was at liberty and available for the right girl. After dinner, they took a walk. And Jeannie noticed how he always tried to keep on her left or right, whichever was nearest to the street. Other men she'd met were never quite so thoughtful. But then Keith wasn't like other men. And Jeannie knew that from the moment she saw him. Jeannie? Yes, Keith? It's been a wonderful evening. Yes. You know, somehow it's been perfect. Nothing has spoiled it. For me. Or for me. Jeannie, may I see you again? You... You really want to? Very much. All right. <laughs> Tomorrow night? <laughs> That's kind of soon, isn't it? Too soon for you? No. It's not too soon for me. Then we have a date. Tomorrow night and... I hope for many nights to come. For many nights to come. That sounded wonderful to Jeannie Clare. It sounded like forever. But she didn't know that forever could be a very short time. Jeannie saw him every night for four weeks in a row. They went everywhere together, to interesting places, to museums and art shows, a concert or two, every once in a while, the theater. 
Not a moving picture. The theater. The legitimate stage, as Keith put it. <laughs> when you've never been in love before and you meet the perfect man, you don't have to think very hard to find out where you stand. After a while, Jeannie stopped telling herself to be sensible and to wait. She was crazy about him, that was that. And then one day, he got a job. He wanted to celebrate and treat Jeannie to something special. They had dinner and danced a lot, then took the subway home. Jeannie, I've got something to tell you. Really, Keith? First of all, let me say that you're the nicest girl I ever met in my life. Keith. And you understand me more than anyone else I've ever known. Jeannie, I haven't let our relationship get too personal up to now because, well, somehow I felt I didn't have a right to. You shouldn't have felt like that. Oh, well. well it was mostly money, I guess. I, uh, I didn't have very much saved up. And an actor never knows when he's going to get another job. But you've got one now. Yeah. Oh, Jeannie, it's a wonderful party. You know, if this play clicks, well, when and if that happens, Jeannie, I'll have something more to tell you. You uh, couldn't tell me now. Uh, 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 no, not just yet. But if you want to, you can guess and you'll probably be right. I, I think I know, Keith. I'm very glad. You know, sometimes I think I'm a very lucky girl, Keith. Why? Well, things happen if you wait for them long enough, and, and the things that happen are usually nice. Oh, not like that poor kid or whoever she was. What poor kid? See the paper that man is reading across the aisle? Oh, yeah? Look what that headline says. Young girl slain by maniac. Isn't it awful? Maybe it's selfish of me to say so. But I'm sure glad things like that only happen to other people. And I only have to read about them in the papers. I'm sure glad only nice things happen to me. When Keith said goodnight at the door, he bent down and kissed Jeannie's hand. And Jeannie seemed to know even before he did it that that was just the thing he'd do. When she got inside her room, she was much too excited to sleep. So she tried to read a while, and she opened the paper Keith had bought her as he left the subway. Then Jeannie saw that headline again. It gave a full description of the murder and where the victim was found. The girl was 24 and pretty. She'd been keeping company with an unknown man, and a description by one of the neighbors tallied with a description of a maniac who killed another girl a week before. The description followed, and Jeannie read it aloud to herself. Five feet ten, nice looking. Dressed in perfect taste. He flatters the girls he meets with his continental manners. And his voice is low and soft. He, he's never seen without a derby hat. His gloves are always new. And by profession, he claims to be an actor. <laughs> You know, there are people in the world who never grow old, even though they live to be a hundred years old. Somehow they shoulder their cares very lightly, and their minds remained young and strong. Jeannie Clare's mind was young and it was strong, but she grew up far beyond her years when she read that paper. She just sat there and shook her pretty head in a funny sort of a way. You could see she didn't want to believe what she read. She was trying to convince herself it was only a coincidence. Well, Jeannie, perhaps it is. There are many men who could answer that description, and lots of them could be actors. Only this particular man is the man you love. Remember that. But suddenly, Jeannie noticed another fact. The man they were after had come from Chicago. They traced him to New York from there. Well, that was different. Hadn't Keith told her his folks lived in St. Louis? Of course he had. At least twice. Jeannie laughed in relief. <laughs> then fell asleep on the couch from sheer nervous exhaustion. The next evening, as she and Keith walked up the street after dinner, Jeannie was ashamed of herself for ever having the thoughts she'd had. He was so tall and straight in his well-kept clothes, and she felt proud just to be walking by his side. Somehow he was even nicer than he'd ever been before. 
And he started to tell her about the play he was in. It's a melodrama, Jeannie. A what? You know, a play about crime. Oh. <laughs> Not the usual one, though. Well, I think it ought to be a hit. I hope so, Keith. <laughs> you know, I guess ordinarily I wouldn't have taken a part like that. Ah, you know the way I am, Jeannie. I worship Shakespeare. I, I'd rather... Well, I'd rather carry a sword in Hamlet than have a lead in any comedy in town. But, uh... I don't know. This part should give me the foothold I need. And, uh, at least I'll start to make enough money to plan for the future. You... You mean you took this part just for me, Keith? Uh, let's say I took it for both of us, and we'll let it go at that, huh? Hey, would you like to see a rehearsal one day? Oh, I sure would. <laughs> you won't let it scare you, I hope. Scare me? Well, the play is pretty violent. In fact, it's quite a shock. You see, it involves a homicidal maniac, a man who likes to kill for pleasure. <laughs> it's got... You dropped your purse. Hey, Jeannie, you've broken your mirror. Keith? Yes, Jeannie? Someday I... I'd like to meet your folks. Someday you shall, Jean. I I know St. Louis is a long way off, but... St. Louis? Oh, they don't live there anymore. But, but you told me. Oh, they were born there. Oh, yeah. But a couple of years ago, they moved, Jeannie. They did? To where? Chicago. Chicago. It couldn't have been Los Angeles or Salt Lake City. It had to be Chicago. And Jeannie almost felt she was going to be sick. She managed to keep herself composed until they said goodnight, though. Keith was due at rehearsal at eight, so he didn't take her home. And Jeannie was never so glad to get back to her room in her life. She sat down near the radio and tried to catch her breath. Her head was pounding and she could hardly think. She kept saying over and over to herself, Is Keith the man they want? She couldn't turn him in unless she was sure. And how could she be sure? Then she turned the radio on. She didn't know exactly why. She was frightened. Lonesome, miserable. She wanted to hear a voice, any voice, someone who'd talk to her so she'd know she wasn't alone. She heard a voice all right, and the words burned holes in her heart. And the United Nations will discuss the matter during the next session. New York. The police have unearthed new evidence concerning a homicidal maniac who's gone and claimed three victims thus far. He apparently was able to hoodwink his unhappy victims into believing he'd fallen in love with them and was about to propose marriage. No. The police are hoping to apprehend the killer before he has a chance to add another victim to his list. She gave them her name and told them where he worked. He'd be at the theater now, she said, in rehearsal. They promised to send a squad car and a detective over to her place in 15 minutes for her protection. 15 minutes. That wasn't long by the usual standards. But as Jeannie hung up, she began to experience the most harrowing 15 minutes of her life. Huh? Jeannie! Jeannie, you're there! What are you doing here? When you left me an hour ago, I was worried. You behaved so strangely. I, I thought of calling you. Then decided to come instead. And just talk to you. But, but what about rehearsal, Keith? Oh, that. <laughs> well, I rehearsed for ten minutes and I left the theater. Oh, well, don't worry. I, I promised I'd be back in an hour or two. Anyway, I'm... I'm not in the second act of it. Jeannie. Yes. What's the matter? Why do you keep... moving away from me like that? I, I haven't been moving Jeannie. away. Jeannie. What's happened? Why do you stare at me? It, almost as though you're afraid. I... I wish you'd leave me alone for a while. Just a little while, Keith, I... Jeannie, you've got to tell me what's wrong. Has it been because... Because I haven't asked you to marry me yet? No, no, it's not that. Jeannie, come here. Jeannie had moved to the other end of the room and her back was against the wall. Fifteen minutes, they told her. It would take a detective fifteen minutes to arrive, but fifteen minutes might be too late. Keith kept coming closer, smiling, talking, his hands and arms stretched out. Then she saw a bulge in his right-hand coat pocket, and she knew it was a gun. Jeannie, darling, what's the matter? You mustn't be afraid of me. His hands were on her shoulders now, and he was pulling her close. For a moment, she could hardly breathe. And then she let him kiss her. 
She had to because she wanted to get hold of that gun. Oh, gee. Inch by inch, her hand crept toward his pocket. And then inside, she felt the trigger and then the handle. And with all the strength she had left, she pulled it out and fired. <laughs> Lady, he ain't the guy we're looking for. What? A guy? We caught that girl killer half an hour ago. Jeannie just stood there and looked at him. The words just didn't sink in. And then she started to laugh. She laughed and she couldn't control herself. She laughed until she cried. For it was then that Jeannie realized that she had killed the wrong man. Hey, miss. Hey, miss, hang on to yourself. Sorry, Sergeant. I, I, that, that officer must have thought that I was the one who, who was crazy when he brought me here. Uh, well, now we'll see when he gets back. Just relax. Take it easy. Yeah. What? Did you say something, Sergeant? No, I didn't. Uh, look behind you. Jeannie. Here's your corpse, Sarge. Only ain't so stiff. He walked down here by himself. And there's the rod. Filled with blanks. Can you beat it? That? Huh? It's just a prop we use in the play. I guess I forgot to leave it at the theater tonight when I left the rehearsal. When you fired it, Jeannie, I... Must have got such a shock I passed out. I... I can't believe it. It's all right, Jeannie. It's all right. I know what happened. It's all right now. Come on, Jeannie. I'll take you home. That's the story of Jeannie Clare as recorded by The Clock. Well, I see we've used up our allotted span, for the clock keeps running. And the hands keep moving around. So, good people, accept each minute with gratitude and with joy. Time is good to most of you, and most of you make good use of time. But remember, it's later than you think, so use your time well this week. And return again to listen to The Clock. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program is written by Lawrence Clee, and you heard Hart McGuire as the clock. And as Jeannie, Wendy Playfair. As Keith, John Mellion. Others in the cast were Joan Lander, Derek Barnes, and Joe McCormick. The clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Nice to see you again. Pleasant to be back. Got a little time to spare, 30 minutes maybe, by the clock. Funny thing about time, to some it's priceless, to others it has no value. It's the most perishable commodity in the world, and yet it lasts forever. If we lose it, we're unhappy, but we don't mind giving it away. 
For instance, there was young Joey. Have you ever heard of Joey Harper? Well, perhaps you haven't. He's a likable young fellow, though, alert, ambitious, and cheerful. Well, usually cheerful, anyway. For even the best of dispositions can often change. I'd like to tell you about Joey. Will you listen? It might be worth your while. It's so amazing you may not believe it, although it could have happened to you. Oh, listen, Lois, listen. you got to listen. It wasn't my fault. Oh, gee, honey, I love you. I wouldn't hurt you, Lois, for all the money in the world. All the money in the world. Joey used those words before, but in a different way. Joey felt that money made the clock go round, and that everyone had it but him. Joey? Yeah? What are you thinking about? Your old lady. What? I, I mean your mother. Oh. Gee, I'm sorry about what she said, Joey. Ah, uh, not your fault. Maybe I'll never have any more doll than I got right now. Maybe she's right, I'm just about. Oh, don't say that, Joey. You've got to give yourself a little time. Time? How much time do you think I got? I'm 22, Lois, practically middle-aged. I'll be tripping over my beard before I get a nickel in the bank. Maybe it's your job, Joey. Oh, no, no, it's not my job, Lois. I've done everything from selling insurance to driving a hack. But I always make the same amount, 35 bucks a week. <gasps> You can't expect to be successful overnight. Other guys can do it. Why can't I? You know, it's like a jinx. I work like a dog. I, I yell for a raise. I, I stick my nose to the grindstone till it hurts. But it always comes out the exact same way, Lois. Thirty-five smackers a week. Everybody can't be rich, I guess. Everybody can't have a million dollars. I wish I was so rich that a million was just like chicken feed. I, I wish I had all the money in the world. Joey? Yeah? Look at this window display. Oh, isn't that a lovely ring? I'll say it is. Which one are you looking at? The one with all those diamonds. Oh, that's not the one I mean, silly. I'm talking about the gold one. The plain one over there. The, the wedding ring. Oh. I guess it isn't really very expensive, is it? Well, who cares? We're not going to buy it. Joey! Oh, let's face it, Lois. You know your mother won't let you get married to me. She thinks I'm a lamb and she wants to settle low with cash. We just have to be patient. Barry Cannon's the guy for her. His old man's got dough. He'll own the business one of these days and he'll be in solid. Me? I'm just a jerk. Joey, please don't spoil the evening by talking that way. Harry's the perfect son-in-law. He's got dough in his pocket and a new suit in his back. Even the fillings in his teeth are made of gold. And someday I'm going to knock them out one by one just to prove my point. Joey, if you dare get into a fist fight with Barry Cannon, I... Why, there he is. That's Barry in that car. Hi there, sweetie. Hello, Barry. How goes it, Joe? Pretty good. Until you got here. <laughs> How do you like the bus? Why, it's no, Barry. Yeah, it's to be back 1500 It's got style. Oh, I think it's lovely. Don't you, Joey? It reminds me of a hearse. Joey! Still sore at the world, Joey? Why don't you take that over-polished kitty car and go right home? Joey, I wish you wouldn't be so rude. Oh, that's all right, Lois. I don't bruise easily. You coming to my party on Friday night? Well... We're dressing, you know. It's formal. Well, we're not going, Barry. Or if you're worried about the clothes, I can lend you my dinner jacket. I'm wearing tails. You'd certainly look good with tails, Barry. Hanging from a tree. Joey! <laughs> all right, all right. If this guy appeals to you so much, Lois, I'll bow out. I'm sick and tired of hearing him talk about himself. And I'm sick and tired of hearing your family talk about me. Hey, hey, what is this? Lover's quarrel? Barry, you driving up town? Sure. Would you drop me off at my home? Hop in. When you're ready to apologize, Joey Harper, you can let me know. Joey just stood there and watched Lois drive away. And he felt she didn't understand. The tragedies of youth can be painful things, mellowed only by time alone. If he could only have explained to Lois. If he could have only told her... You... You don't know what it means, Lois, when a... When a guy can't afford to buy his girl an engagement ring... When I take you to the movies, we always sit in the cheapest seats. <sighs> After a while, Lois, it gets so you begin to think that money's the most important thing on earth. 
And you can't live without it. Sometimes you even feel you don't want to live without it. Yes, if Joey could have told her that, the story might have been different. But he didn't. He had too much pride. So he merely watched the girl he loved drive away with another boy. Then he turned and walked slowly home. But every once in a while, he'd pause in front of a shop window and look hungrily inside. Beautiful, aren't they? What? Those ermine wraps. Huh. Oh, yeah, they cost a lot of dough. In the next shop, they have a cigarette case made of solid gold. You know, it'd take me a week to make enough money to even buy the boxes they come in. That money won't bring you happiness. That line was invented for laugh by the guys who got it. Really? And the laugh? Is on guys like me. Uh, you're wrong, my boy. Who says so? Who are you, anyway? I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to intrude. He was a little old man in a worn felt hat. And to Joey, he seemed as old as... Well, time. He seemed to shuffle as he walked, as if his balance was bad, and Joey saw him start to cross the street. The light suddenly changed, and the heavy surge of traffic made the old man panicky. He started to run without looking around. And the driver and the bus turned the corner and didn't see him. And then Joey Harper bounded forward and made a flying dive. The two of them rolled over to the curb. <laughs> what happened? You almost got killed, that's what. Here. Let me help you up. Uh, thank you. That bus, I didn't see that bus. Look, mister. In New York, you watch where you go when you cross the street. Those ten-ton buses can make a permanent crease in your future. Yes, I guess I'm not used to all this traffic, but you saved my life, young man. Oh, forget it. No, 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 young man, you saved my life. Not that it's worth very much to me, but I have a great capacity for gratitude. Well, I, I guess you and I are in the same boat, Pop, when you say your life isn't worth very much. But I'm old, and I have no one who cares. But you're young and strong. Why do you feel the way you do? It's simple, Pop. I'm broke. You mean you haven't got a job? Well, I got a job. I can always get a job. But what good does it do? I'll never make enough to live the way I like. How would you like to live? You ever read The Count of Monte Cristo? Yeah. Well, that's the kind of dough I'd like to have. Not a thousand bucks or even a million. I'd like to have so much money, there'd be no end to it. I'd like to wrap up the world in cellophane and stick it in my pocket like a pack of cigarettes. Yes, but money isn't everything. <laughs> it's enough for me. You see, I have the kind of money that you talk about. Unlimited quantities to do with as I please. I am the richest man who ever lived. But it doesn't make me happy. Pop, you... You didn't crack your head on that curb, did you? You, you, you still okay? Where do you live, young man? 87 Level Street, why? And what's your name? Joey Harper. My name is Pickering, and I'm going to reward you for saving my life. <laughs> you better keep your money, mister. You look like you need as much as me. I said I'm going to reward you, Joey. And I mean it. Yeah? I'm going to give you all the money in the world. Joey watched the old gentleman shuffle away. And in spite of his depression, Joey smiled. All the money in the world. Joey doubted if the old man had anything more valuable to give away than his time. But Joey didn't know how valuable the old man's time could be. A few minutes later, Joey reached his furnished room. He'd made a big decision. He was going away for good. He'd forgotten all about Mr. Pickering by the time he'd packed his bag. But when he opened the door to go, the old man was standing there with an envelope in his hand. Good evening. Oh, hello, Mr. Pickering. Are you going somewhere? I'm getting out of this town. For keeps. I'm through bucking the system. I know when I'm licked. Do you have a minute to spare? Sure. Come in. Thanks. So this is where you live. Yeah. Classy, isn't it? Do you prefer more elaborate quarters? And I'm going to get it, too. Tomorrow night I'll probably sleep in the park, and then I'll have plenty of room to move around. <laughs> I'd suggest a four-story brownstone mansion. I believe there's one available right now. Of course, you'd have to arrange for a staff of servants, but <laughs> that could be managed, too. What are you trying to do? Give me a ride? You can give it to me, Joey, when you get your limousine. Well, right now I'm using the subject. Joey! 
Come back, Joey. Would you mind leaving me alone? Come back, Joey. And open this envelope. It may change your mind about many things. What's in that envelope? When you open it, you'll see. But before you do, remember this is only a trickle. It's a drop in the bucket. There's more where that came from, lots more, and I promise you I'll keep you well supplied. You, you must be nuts. I have no more use for what you'll find in that envelope, Joey. I've achieved my goal, you see. I only hope it'll help you to achieve your own. Go on. Open it, Joey. Hey! Hey! It's money! A half a million dollars in thousand dollar bills. It's yours, Joey. It's all yours. Have you ever wished upon a star and had that wish fulfilled? It's common among mortal men. Joey knew the meaning of wish fulfillment when he stared at all the money on that table. For five full minutes, and I timed him personally, he didn't move. Five hundred thousand dollars. And Mr. Pickering had said it was only a drop in the bucket. What are you thinking of, Joey? I... I... Are you planning to do a lot with your money, or are you thinking of uh, calling the police? I just can't talk. I... No, no, Joey. I didn't rob a bank or lift a payroll. Then where'd you get the money? Are you asking questions, Joey? Are you going to waste time in quibbling? Or are you going out to satisfy every dream and every ambition you've ever had? You're right, Mr. Pickering. I'm just a sap. I... I've been tearing my hair and beating my chest and praying for a break. And then when I get one, I... I'm scared. Scared? What's there to be frightened about? You didn't steal anything. There's everything you have ever wanted on that table, and there's more to come. So why bother with questions? Grab it, Joey. Stuff it in your pockets. Go out and spend it. You just watch my scene. <laughs> There's a store downtown, Joey. An expensive establishment that deals in boats. They have a yacht in the sail. And that's the first on my list. I'll stop with the expensive stuff and then work my way down the scale of the junk. Where's my hat? Oh, never mind. I'll buy a couple of dozen on my way down. That's a nice club you got standing there, mister. Yes, it is, isn't it? And what's it cost? Well, that yacht is our largest model. Ninety feet accommodates 14 people. Its cabins are completely furnished. It requires a crew of six. I ask what it cost. $145,000. F-O-B. I'll take it. You what? I said I'll take it. <laughs> and how will you pay for it? In cash. One hundred and forty-five thousand. Any tax? You... You got that cash in your pocket? One hundred and forty-five thousand on the nose. No tax? The tax is included, sir. Uh, have it shipped to the Hudson River and let me know what pier. Uh, I'll give you my address and you just give me a receipt. And if you're a nice boy, I'll come around and buy another one. When the paint wears off the one I got. You've heard of King Midas? Well, he was a candidate for the poorhouse compared with Joey Harper. You wouldn't believe what he managed to accomplish in the next three hours. You wouldn't believe it unless I gave you my word for it, and I was there with him when it happened. One sixteen cylinder limousine, I'll pay for it in cash. Yes, sir. One ermine wrap from a gold friend, and I'll pay for it in cash. Yes, sir. Ha, <laughs> this telco looks nice. I'll take four, and don't forget the shoes, the shirts, the socks, and the suits. I want the most expensive money can buy. Oh, yeah, and throw in those garters over there. You know, the ones with the diamond buckles? And stick my initials on everything, brother, just the way I like. <laughs> If you got something to sell, then bring it up. I'll buy anything and everything just as long as it isn't cheap. And I'll pay for it in cash. Yes, sir. Good evening, Joey. Mr. Beckering. I hope you don't mind my waiting here in your room. I was wondering how you made out. Oh, I'm doing fine. I, I just bought that four-story private house. You know the one that faces Fifth Avenue? And I told him to throw in the doorman for luck. How does it feel to have all that money? Oh, it feels like being on a merry-go-round. You, uh... Haven't got tired of it yet? Tired of it? You mean there are people who get tired of money? I was merely asking. Brother, I'll never get tired of it. Well, enjoy yourself, Joey. I, I presume you have everything you want. Just about, except my girl. But when her mother hears about this doll, 
Well, yeah, but th th that reminds me. I, I'm running short. <laughs> I thought you might. Uh, I don't like to be a hog about this, Mr. Pickering, but you told me it was only a drop in the bucket. Quite so. And half a million isn't nearly enough for what I want to buy. I guessed as much, so I took the liberty of bringing more. You mean... Inside the suitcase? Yes, Joey. There's ten million dollars in here. Ten million? Do you think it might last for the rest of the week? However, it I... doesn't matter. There's really no limit to what you can spend. Oh, uh, Joey, the money is mostly in thousand-dollar bills. So I noticed. And uh, just in case you've been having trouble changing bills of that denomination, I've added a few hundred thousand in fives and tens. I hope you don't mind. Ten million dollars. Holy smoke. Enjoy it, Joey. And remember that the bucket hasn't even been touched. What a boat, Joey. And what a car. That's the slickest job I ever saw. Now come around on Sunday, Barry, and I'll have my chauffeur take you for a spin around the park. Oh, Joey, darling, I think it's wonderful. Mother just can't wait until we get married. Well, she'll just have to wait. Tell her to take it easy, and maybe I'll even invite her to the wedding. Two Rembrandts and one Da Vinci. Is there anything else you'd like to buy, sir? Why, why, sure. There, there, there must be something else. There, there must be. Yes, Joey had bought everything he could think of, and he still had millions left. He had all the money in the world, but he didn't have all the time in the world in which to spend it. Then something peculiar started to happen in Joey's mind. The last shopping spree he'd had wasn't half as much fun as the first. There didn't seem to be anything left for him to buy. He had everything a man could ask for, yet somehow he wasn't happy. And he wondered why. Joey. Oh, hello, Mr. Pickering. I thought I'd come up and see you again once more. Oh, no, now, look, Mr. Pickering, I don't need any more money. Honest, I don't. Look, I'm having a tough enough time right now spending what you gave me, so will you take it easy for a while, please? What's the matter, Joey? You sound unhappy. You have everything you want, everything you've ever wished for. Isn't that enough? Well, it, it should be. <laughs> but it isn't. I know. I came to that conclusion myself. You see, Joey, you have nothing to look forward to, nothing to work for. When things come as easily as they've come to you, they, they lose their value. They become cheap, Joey, even though they're worth a fortune. Is that what happened to you, Mr. Pickering? Yeah, my fate was even worse. All my life I'd lived to achieve one goal, and then when I thought I'd accomplished an artistic triumph, I found that I'd failed. But one day I'll try again, Joey. Oh, yes, one day I'll try again. Uh, try, try what? To make the perfect thousand-dollar bill. You mean... You mean you... You made that money you gave me... Yourself? I am a printer, Joey, and for 20 years I've printed nothing but handbills and dinner menus. But I also happen to be a genius, and I was going to prove it. My goal was to make money so perfect in every detail that the right thing would look like a counterfeit. No. Oh. No. Oh. You didn't make counterfeit, though. You didn't. Now, just a minute, Joey. No. Remember this. I didn't make that money to cheat the government. Oh, no. I never spent a cent of it. To me, it was an artistic goal. No more, no less. I am not a counterfeiter, Joey. I am an artist. Here, Joey, what are you doing? I'm calling the police. Don't bother. They're right outside your door. They followed me here. You got me into this, Mr. Pickering. You got me into this. You got to get me out. Joey, you're getting too excited. I didn't know that though was bad. You gave it to me. You told me it was a reward, Mr. And Pickering. And so it was a generous reward. Open up in the name of the Lord. No. No, they aren't going to take me. Stay out. Stay out of you here. You can't no. escape, Joey. There's nothing you can do. And your time is running short. You and your money. Why'd you keep out of my life? Who wants your money? Who wants it? Who wants it? No. Oh. Why, it's the district attorney himself. Five million dollars. He passed five million dollars in counterfeit money. And we'll give him a year in jail for every nickel. No, no, oh, He no. told me his chauffeur would take me for a ride. Huh. Now he'll take a little ride for himself. Keep away from me. Keep away from me, all of you. My mother was right. Joey Harvey, you've disgraced me. Lois, Lois, you got to listen, Lois. I wouldn't hurt you, Lois. Lois, honest, I wouldn't. Five hundred years in jail. In solitary oh. confinement. And I get the girl. Oh. Five hundred years in jail. And hard labor. And 
I get the girl. <laughs> oh, don't touch me, Lois, Lois. You've got to live. <laughs> Oh, listen. Oh, my thoughts. You've got to listen. Yes, oh, Joey, my I know. We all know, Joey. Oh, Joey, it's all right. Uh, 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 uh. What? Joey. Joey, darling. Lois? Where are we? You're in a hospital, Joey. You've been delirious ever since you started to come out of the ether. Ether? Don't you remember? That old man you tried to save downtown, you pushed him out of the way and the bus hit you. The bus hit me? But the doctor said you'd be all right. Oh, Joey, I was so frightened, so scared I'd lose you. Then, that was all in the mind? Just, just in the mind? You talked so much and said such funny things. The doctor told me that often happens to patients like you. Joey? Well... Haven't you noticed the flowers? Oh, oh, yeah. The flowers. Mother sent them. What? Joey, you're a hero. You've saved somebody's life. You're going to be in the papers tomorrow and everything. But best of all, Mother thinks you're wonderful. And she's planning the wedding just as soon as you're well. Oh, I don't care if we have to struggle a while, because I know you'll make good if we work hard together. Mr. Pickering said you got to have something to look forward to and work for to be happy. Mr. Pickering? Well, who's he? <laughs> Just the guy I met under the ether. Lois, pinch me. Pinch you? What for? I... I just want to make sure I'm still not under the ether. That's the story of Joey Harper as recorded by the clock. Well, it worked out pretty well, all things considered. The moral? Well, yes, I suppose there is a moral to this story, but I prefer to leave it up to you. Sleep on it tonight. Give me your answer in the morning. I'll be at your bedside, but I'll make sure to ring before I drop in. And now it's time to leave you once again. It's been very pleasant for me. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program is written by Lawrence Clee, and you've heard Hart McGuire as the clock, as Joey Rodney Jacobs, as Mr. Pickering Owen Ainley. Others were Carly Neville, John Bonney, Ken Hannum. The clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Good evening. I'm glad to see you set your clock again for me. I brought you another story. It was told to me by a friend of mine, a watchmaker by train. We were uh, tinkering around together, so to speak, when he decided to pass the time of day with a little yarn. <laughs> Passing the time of day is something you can always get me to do, and if I may say so, I do it rather well. You see, I'm one chap who has lots of time on his hands. Well, according to my friend, the story involves a fellow named Littlefield, a man of some intelligence and ingenuity. He was employed by a broker named Roberts as a personal secretary. Their relationship was extremely cordial. Oh, what time is it, Littlefield? It's uh, 10.20, Mr. Roberts. Sorry to have you, you work so late like this. That's quite all right, sir. I don't mind at all. Well, I guess we're just about cleaned up. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. I'll get it. Uh, Mr. Roberts' office. John? Uh, yes. Uh, it's for me, Mr. Roberts. For you all. John. 
What is it, Louise? What's the big idea? Uh, beg your pardon? Don't beg my pardon. What's the big idea? It's almost 10.30. Why aren't you at home? Well, well I, I worked late tonight in the office. Well, why didn't you call me? I'm afraid I forgot. You didn't forget. You did that on purpose. You knew I'd worry. Louise, I'm still working. I sleep over a sap half the day, and you don't even show up for dinner. What do you think I am, a cow? You can't treat me like that and get away Look, with we'll it. We'll discuss it later. We'll discuss it now. I'm sick and tired. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Roberts. Your wife. Yes, it, it wasn't important. Mm, uh, how long have you worked for me, John? Fifteen years, sir. Mm, that's a long time. Yes. Somehow it's brought us very close. You know, I feel I can trust you more than anyone else in the world. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And so I also feel I have the privilege of talking to you like a father. You're in trouble. No, no, no. I mean with your wife. No, not exactly, sir. She's called the office every day now for a week. And, my boy, I know it's upset you. Uh, now, look, I assure you, Mr. Roberts... Come um, now, we can be frank with each other. I'm a man who understands. I, I, I don't know what you, you believe that I'm in, in, in trouble, sir. I tell I'm... you why. You see, I've met your wife. But uh, I've never met that young blonde woman I saw you dining with the other evening. Uh, oh, now, don't look so unhappy. I, I don't hold it against you. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Roberts. A mild flirtation never hurt a man. However, those things can go too far. And I'd hate to see a friend of mine and a trusted employee break up his marriage because of a silly and unimportant episode. Yes, you're quite right, sir. Having never been married myself with no family of my own, perhaps I feel there's something I've missed. I understand. Oh, do you really? Yes. Good. I trust you'll think it over for your own sake. Very, very carefully. Yes, I will, Mr. Robert. <laughs> oh, so much for the fatherly pep talks. Now, if you'll just put this envelope into the office safe, you can go home to your wife. With my apologies for keeping you. Very well, sir. I put it in the safe, Littlefield. You know that envelope contains $1,500 in cash? The Dawson account. I'm depositing it to his name in the morning. Yeah, my boy, what's the matter? S sir? You keep staring at the safe dial. Now, don't tell me you've forgotten the combination after all these years. <laughs> no, 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 sir. <laughs> I was just thinking of something. Yeah, your wife? Yes, sir, my wife. Ah, then you've made up your mind. I think so, Mr. Roberts. Good. Yes, yes, sir. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Sugar. I'm sorry, Gloria. I'm waiting on. About a half an hour. I don't have a sandwich. You want one? Oh, no, no. Please. I'm not having any dessert. i got to watch my figures. I'm liable to lose my man if I lose my figures. You'll never lose me, beautiful. Here we go again. Same old malarkey. What, 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 what do you mean? Go on. Tell me how nuts you are about me. Give me that bunk about not being able to live without me. Bunk? Sure. Because right after you say to go back to your wife. But Gloria, honey, I... I've been doing a lot of thinking, John. There don't seem to be much future in it. Future in what? You. You don't mean... How long do we go on this way until I'm old and you kick off and leave her your insurance? Is that all you're thinking about? Insurance? Oh, so well, Harry, look at it my way for a change. She's got the security. I got the romance. But in the end, she gets the last laugh. Yes, maybe you're right, Gloria. You do have a right to think of yourself. Well, what are you going to do about it? You know Louise won't give me a divorce. So what am I supposed to do? Take the rap? No, no, no. I'm not taking any raps. Gloria, I, I've made up my mind. We're going away. Huh? On what? I'll have money. Your wife banks every nickel you earn in her name. You don't earn much anyway. Well, I, I have another source. Oh, Yeah. Yes, I can get hold of $1,500, Gloria. It's, it's a good start. Oh, it's a good start, he's even the swell thing. Yeah, well, we'll leave, we'll leave town. We'll never come back. Just just you and I. Mm -hmm. Well, what about your job? Oh, I'm sick of my job, and I'm sick of that old fool, Robert. <laughs> I don't blame you. Skills been only raised once in the last five years. Isn't that what you're telling Yeah, that's me? quite right. You know, he should have been a lecturer, not a broker. He's always given me good advice. I can find myself another stooge. I'm finished. Why don't we leave, Sugar? Tonight. Tonight? When will you get the doll? Tonight. 
They say the right man can take 40 years to acquire a superior intelligence, and the wrong woman can make a fool of him in 40 minutes. John Littlefield was no exception to this rule. He had the key to the office, and he had the combination to the safe. The rest was easy, or so he thought. Four, first to 12, back to one. Can do it. Ah, oh, my nose. Fifteen hundred and fifty dollar bills. What? John! What are you doing here? I... I, I just returned it. You... You opened the safe. That money you wanted to steal it. Get out of my way, Mr. Roberts. Oh, John, you fool. Did you really think you could get away with this? Don't you know how obvious it would have been? Why'd you have to come back? I'd forgotten something. Sorry, now I did. I would have preferred you to get away with this, John. And to get you red-handed. Get out of the way. Put that phone down. John! Put it down, you... Come on, let go of me. Come on, let go, you idiot. Let go! All right, now get up and keep quiet. I don't want to hit you, but I will if you open your mouth. Come on. Come on, get up, I say. Mr. Roberts, get up. Mr. Roberts. What's the matter with you? Wait. Mr. Roberts, wake up. Mr. He's dead. Who are you? Come on, Luther. Don't you remember me? Oh. <laughs> well, what do you know? John Littlefield. The boy most likely to succeed. Come in. If you are the last man in the world I have expected to see, John Littlefield. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a few years. I'll say it has. Say, how, how did you know where I lived? Well, I, I saw your address in the, in the papers when your case came out in the court. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, it took away my license to practice, but who cares? I still know more about surgery than the whole stupid lot of them put together. Well, apparently they believe that drunkenness isn't uh, not exactly becoming to a surgeon. Particularly when he has a scalpel in his hand. I never like medicine anyway. The hours are rotten. How about a drink? No. I don't have one. No. What? I need you cold sober, Bixby. You need me? How you been doing since you lost your license? Oh, you buy? Yeah, but not too well, I can see that. Bixby, you used to have a small uh, private hospital in this place, didn't you? What well, about it? Uh, do, well, do you still have enough uh, equipment to, uh, to, to perform an operation? You forget. I'm not a doctor anymore. Look, do you have the equipment, Luther? Just tell me. Oh, yes, yeah, it's all here. I'm getting rid of some of you, you need money, eh? Plenty of business. Yeah, but uh, how would you like to make $1,500, $1,500, Luther? What? $1,500 in cash. Cold cash. I have it with me. What do I have to do? Let's just, just perform a little operation on me. But I... I told you, I'm not allowed to practice. That's why I'm here. I don't want anybody to know about this operation, but, but you. Sit down. Thanks. Now, what kind of an operation do you want me to perform? You are quite well known for your technique in plastic surgery. Mm, what about it? I think you could change my face. You know, everything about me so that, so that even my own wife wouldn't recognize me. You crazy little fish. Just answer my question, yes or no. Uh, I haven't got any time to argue. Uh, could be married. Yeah, could. Well, can, can you graft skin out of my fingertips? The full uh, fingerprint expert? Maybe. Uh, I could do that. You, you're quite sure, Bixby. You, you're quite sure you can change me completely. Well, it would require a lot of work. Uh... I could cut the facial nerves and change the muscular appearance of your cheeks. Uh, if I extracted all your teeth and put in a couple of bridges, your mouth would be different. Yeah, well, what else? I could change the shape of your nose, give you a scar across scar one across eyebrow. Very good. Yeah. I would even change the expression of your eyes. Uh, your hair could be dyed gray. I might give you a permanent bald spot on your head. Yeah, good, good. That, that sounds perfect. Yeah. I could change you, little fear, so you wouldn't even recognize yourself. And would you do all this without asking any questions? For $1,500? Yeah, $1,500. You'd be taking a chance. I have to work without a nurse. But I don't care. I'm used to taking chances. 
You must be very anxious to avoid the police. I said without asking any questions, Bixby. Tell me, is it a, is it a deal or isn't it? We'll operate. Tonight. Time, like everything else, is relative, according to our thoughts and surroundings. To a man who is happy in his work, it has wings. To a fugitive from justice, it barely moves. And three weeks of convalescence have made John Littlefield a very impatient man. How do you feel, John? I'd love to have it. When are you going to take these bandages off my face? Well, let's see if we're ready. I think we are. Yeah? Yes, yes, it looks like this well, is let's it. let's get them off. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me do it. Hurry up, I'm say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to get quite a surprise, Littlefield. Am I? Why do you see yourself in the mirror? Have you, have you done a good job? I've never done better. I've earned my money, too. Yeah, all right. Cooped up in this house with you for three weeks without a drink has been quite a trial. Look, you can drink yourself to death after I leave. <laughs> yes, no doubt I will. Uh, here we are. Now, let's have a look at you. Well? Look in this mirror over here. Hey, hey, Bixby. How do you like it? Well, my man, you, you were right. You know, it, it, it's, it's even hard for me to recognize myself. There are only two people in this world who will ever know who you are. <laughs> the patient and his eminent surgeon. Now, um... I'd like to get paid. Hi, I'm, I'm going to pay you, Bixby, but... Uh, what, what, suppose we have a little drink first? Oh, Dr. Bixby has never been known to refuse. <laughs> okay, let me pour it in, huh? Oh, where did you find that bottle? In your closet. I made certain to hide it from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're quite a character, little Bill. Yeah. Here we are. Let's drink up and have it straight. Well, here's to a great future. For both of us. Yeah, especially for you. Well, uh, Bixby, what are your plans? Do you intend to blackmail me? Oh, no, 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 not really. That won't be necessary. You see, I uh, expect you to uh, voluntarily make a small donation every now and then, and, you know, for all Lang's yes, eyes. Yeah. Well, I hate to disappoint you. Oh, don't let that bother you. What? <laughs> What's the matter with me? Having a little trouble, Bixby? I... My eyes! Uh, I... Yes, uh, you had a little vial like poison on your shelf over there. Uh, you know, I, I picked it up a few days ago for just this contingency. <laughs> it was in your drink, Bixby. Uh, no, you, you never get away with this. Oh, don't be ridiculous, man. Mm. When the body of Dr. Bixby, the eminent mm. surgeon, has found the case will to the suicide. Uh, no. It'll be obvious that you killed yourself because of shame. <laughs> uh. Uh. Well, well. Uh, you said there are only two people in this world who'd ever know who I am, Bixby. You know something? Now there's only one. Yes, John Littlefield had it all worked out. His timing, so to speak, was perfect. A few minutes later, he dropped his hat and his coat in the river. The coat contained an identification. His own. And from that instant onward, one John Littlefield ceased to exist. And then to make certain he'd be safe for the rest of his life, he made a bold and daring move. Something I can do for you, mister? Uh, yeah, well, yes, yes, you can. They told me downstairs that I'd find the uh, chief of detectives here. Yeah, that's me. Oh, good, well. Uh, I was standing near the waterfront a little while ago, and uh, I, I saw a man jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd have gone in after myself to save him, but I, I can't swim, you see. And, uh, there was nobody else around. Did he go under? Oh, yes, yes, he did. Yeah, but there was a top coat he'd taken off just before he jumped. You know, I brought it along. Well, this is it here. And there's a name inside on the pocket. Let me have a look. There you are. John Littlefield. Yeah, I can describe him for you. He was, he was tall. He, I'd say about my height. He had dark hair and, and regular-looking features. And we've been looking for that guy for weeks. You have? Yeah. His buzz died less than a month ago. Oh, fancy that. A rich old guy named Robert. Heart attack. Then Littlefield disappeared. Did you, did you say heart attack? Yep. Found him in his office in the middle of the night. Too much work. The old gent didn't know when to take it easy. Yeah, but uh, look, why, why have you been looking for, for Littlefield? Well, the old guy didn't have any family. He left Littlefield all his dough. 
Oh, amount of almost uh, half a million bucks. Oh. Yeah. Then the lucky dope takes a powder with some dame. His wife told us. Hey, what's the matter with you? Uh, uh, nothing, man. Yeah, I guess it got you when you saw him jump. Okay, sit down and take it easy for a while. Go on. Yeah. I'll send out a squad to start grappling for the body. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you're, you're not going to like this, but... Uh, well, I... got to admit it was only a joke. What? I, I d- didn't see anybody jump at all. I... I'm John Littlefield. You don't say. I was Mr. Robert's secretary. It, it's true, I ran away because I was sick of my wife, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm back now. You, I, I'm back. What do you take me for, Mr. A cluck? No, no, look, no, look you've got to believe me. I I only, I only, gave you that story about seeing somebody jump in the river because of... Because you what? Well, I... I, I look, I, I got a fix of Littlefield right here in this drawer. Yeah. Yeah, we got it from his wife. Now, just take a look, Sonny. Take a good look. Yeah, well, if you and this picture got anything in common, I'll eat it. The envelope and all. But, but, but look, uh, sir, you, you don't understand. I understand it's enough to slap you in jail for fraud. I got half a mind to do it. You must be crazy to think you get away with something like this. Now, get out of here, you cheap chiseler, before I really get sorry. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Look, you don't believe me, but I'll prove who I am. I, I, I'm, I'm going to prove it if it's the last thing I do. Gloria. Who are you? I'm John Gloria, John Littlefield. You're crazy. Look at me, Gloria. Look look very closely. Don't don't you see? Can't you recognize me? I've never seen you before in my life. Get out. But you don't understand. Look, I've, I've, yeah, I know. I've changed my face. I, I, I look different, but I'm, I'm still John Littlefield. Gloria, you've got to believe me. My boy, listen to my voice. Can't you? Can't you? Get out before I call the cops, you lunatic. Get out! <laughs> Time has a way of meeting out justice, hasn't it? Listen, as the clock ticks on for John Littlefield. Louise. What, what are you doing in my apartment? I'm your husband, Louise. I'm John Littlefield. Keep away from me. Surely you can identify me. Look, you're my own wife. I, I know, I changed my face, but it, it, it doesn't change my identity. Louise, you've got to see that, don't I you? I never saw you before in my life. You're not my husband. My husband is dead. No, he's not dead. They only think I'm dead. How did I get the key to the, the apartment? You know what? I had it with me all the time. It's my key, that's why. And, and I'm your husband. Look, Lu- Louise, for heaven's sake, you've got to believe me. You're crazy. You're crazy. Look, Louise, listen, listen, listen to me very carefully. Now, if, if I can identify myself, <laughs> we'll have half a million dollars. Robert's left it to me, Louise. To me, half a million. It's enough to live like kings for the rest of our lives. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I recognize you now. Of course, John. I know you. No, no. Look, you're only saying that because you're afraid. You, you, you don't really believe me just, at all. Look, just let me... Go to near the phone. Please, mister. I never did anything to you. Leave me alone. Oh. I haven't got any money. Take whatever you want and leave me alone, please. Oh. I should have known. Bixby did a good job, all right. If I, if I can't convince you, I... <laughs> who, who, who can I convince? Look, you remember me, did Detective Henderson? Do you remember me? I sure. You're the guy who said he was little. Yeah, that, that's right. Well, I also said I, I could p- prove it to you, and I can. I, I can identify myself. Oh, now that's very interesting. Y- yes, I can. Yeah. Well, matter of fact, we've been looking for you, Mister. You have? Hmm. Tell me about this uh, identification you've got. Yeah. Well, instead, in the excitement, you see, I, I forgot I even had it. But mm. <laughs> funny thing, it was on my finger all the time. What was? The, the ring, this onyx ring. You see it? it <laughs> I was a fool not to think about it before. Let me see that. There's an inscription in a, in a band. Yeah. See, it, it, John Littlefield from Ralph Roberts. Uh-huh. He, when Mr. Roberts gave it to me years ago. He's very fond of me. That's why I left me his money. I was very faithful to him. He, he liked me like a son. He, he, he wanted to pay me. Now, look, look at the ring, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking. Well, doesn't it convince you? Sure. A lot of things. Come on. What do you mean? Where are we going? To the city morgue. There's something I'm going to show you. Over here, mister. A 
Pick up that sheet. No, go I don't. On, go on, go on. Pick it up. He's been dead for three weeks. Oh. The car in a figure he was slugged and pushed into the river just about the time you told me you saw him fall in. Oh, no. It isn't easy to recognize his face, is it? Oh, That's what water does to a buddy after a while. We found him in that shirt and those shorts he's wearing. But we also found his coat and hat in another part of the river. With identification cards. You mean? There's Littlefield, mister. <laughs> you took his ring and his wallet. No, and took him catching on his inheritance, too. No. Why, of all the crusty schemes I ever heard of, this one takes the but cake. How can you be sure it's Littlefield? Why do you identify a corpse you never saw before and then call me a liar? His Why wife you... identified him, mister. His wife? Sure. But you couldn't. And if you think she's going to change her mind, you're deafier than I figured. <laughs> now, when she comes into that half a million dollars Littlefield got from his boss... That's impossible. No, I don't believe it. You're trying to fool You'll me. You'll believe it, mister. No, no, when don't. you get the chair for the money of John Littlefield. <laughs> Everybody's trying to get the money. I won't let him have it. I want the money. I want to keep it. <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. <laughs> And that's the story of Mr. Littlefield as recorded by the clock. Rather ironic, isn't it? Imagine being convicted for the murder of yourself. But then, justice has its own peculiar way of balancing the scales, and always in good time, those scales meet out their just and logical punishment. Well, I see my time is nearly up, and I must hurry off. I'll be seeing you again even sooner than you think. On a mantelpiece, perhaps, or I may look down on your Sunday morning from the steeple of the church. In any case, when we meet again, you can rest assured for one thing, I'll be right on time. The Clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and starring Hart McGuire as The Clock. You heard Joe McCormick as John Littlefield, Ken Wayne as Dr. Bixby, Frank Waters as Robert, Georgie Sterling as Gloria, Pat Martin as Louise, and Grant Taylor as Detective Henderson. The Clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Have you ever seen a one-eyed cat? I saw one once, and its skin was the color of polished ebony. It was owned by a man named Wake, a quiet and gentle old soul who lived far out in the country. You know, people often ask me why I'm always in a hurry, why I never stop or pause. Well, Jasper Wake has never asked this question. You see, for Jasper, time stands still. Yes. Oh, is Mr. Wake at home? Do you have an appointment? I have this letter he sent me. Oh, yes, the practical nurse. Please come in. Thank you. Your name is... Uh, Goff. Leah Goff. I'm Mrs. Wilton, the housekeeper. I suppose you know about Mr. Wake's condition. Well, not exactly. Have you had any experience with paralytic? Oh, yes, yes, plenty. Poor Mr. Wake has been confined to a wheelchair for over a year now. He's unable to move from the waist down. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, but don't sympathize with him. Now, if you come this way, it isn't his pride that makes him reject sympathy. He wants people to be cheerful when they're around him. He doesn't like to make them unhappy. I guess Mr. Wake is just about the nicest, kindest gentleman I've ever known. Just a moment, please. Mr. Wake. Yes, Mrs. Wilton. It's Miss Garth, the practical nurse who answered your advertisement. Well, please show her in. This way, Miss Garth. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Please sit down. Thank you. Quiet, Flora. (laughs) Cats always seem to be a little uneasy in the presence of strangers. (laughs) What's the matter with her? Why does she keep her head to one side that way, Mr. Wake? Uh, She is blind in one eye, poor thing. And it's gotten her into quite a bit of mischief, too. As you can observe, Miss Garth, I'm unable to move out of this wheelchair. Yes, Mrs. Wilton mentioned it to me. Uh, Up to now, I've had a male nurse. Strong young man who's been able to lift me with ease and handle me like a baby. I have a man's strength, Mr. Wake. In my arms and shoulders. (laughs) Uh, uh, Lewis has left me now. He's gotten married. And as I was casting about for a suitable substitute, I thought of hiring a woman. You see, I discovered I need more than mere physical strength in a nurse. You need companionship, Mr. Wake. Uh, Yes, uh, that's it, exactly. I know how it is to be lonely. And I know how a constant friend can make things easier. You seem to be able to read my mind, Miss Garth. Uh, I have a fairly good education, Mr. Wake. Besides, uh, I'm sensitive to my patients. Sensitive? I like to read to them and play for them on the piano. When I go on a case, Mr. Wake, I devote my life to it. And I'd like the chance to devote my life to you. You're an extraordinary woman. Uh, I don't want this position unless I can be sure I'm badly needed. I want you to feel that every minute of the day, every hour, my thoughts are only for your comfort. Your salary... Oh, I don't care about the salary. Oh, this home has a wonderful atmosphere. A chance to belong and be needed. That's all I ask for. (laughs) Nonsense. You'll be paid and well paid. I'm a rich man, if a helpless one. Oh, you won't be helpless any longer, Mr. Wake. I want so to help you. I'm sorry you'll think now that I'm giving you sympathy, but it it isn't that. You'll be giving me much more than I'll be giving you, Mr. Wake. I need someone to depend on me, or I can't exist. And I need someone to depend on. I think we'll get along very well, Miss Garth. I'm sure we will, Mr. Wake. Oh, 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 Laura. (laughs) (laughs) Mrs. Wilton. Oh, yes, Miss Garth. Have you been hired? I have. Oh, I'm so glad. It'll be nice having another woman around the house. Up to now, it's just been Mr. Wake and me since Lewis left. Oh, I'd better fill you in on the routine. Mr. Wake dines at seven while you and I will eat at six, and that gives us time I dine at seven myself, Mrs. Wilton. Oh, Oh, I see. Well, I suppose I can change my hour. There'll be no need for that. What? Mr. Wake and I will dine together. You'll eat by yourself, as usual. Oh, you you have a beautiful garden, Mr. Wake. And you seem to know a great deal about flowers, uh, Miss Garth. I've always loved delicate and gentle things. Yes, you're a gentle person. A very gentle person, and I'm glad you're here. Mrs. Wilton? Uh, What is it, Miss Garth? I left my shoes in the hall this morning. Did you see them? Yes. Then why weren't they polished? Miss Garth, I think it's about time you and I came to an understanding. I'm neither a bootblack nor a chambermaid. Since you came to this house three weeks ago, you've done nothing but order me around. And I'm getting just a little tired of oh, it. you. <coughs> Perhaps that will put you in your place. Oh, oh I won't stand for that. Oh, I'll tell Mr. Wake. That's what you I... Oh, what? Oh, my arm. You're breaking it. Oh, please, please. I could wrench your arm out of its socket with a twist of my hand, Mrs. Oh. Wilton, and I assure you that if you annoy me again, I'll do just that. Oh, please let me go. My shoes are still in the hall. I want them polished within the hour. Do you understand? Yes, yes only please don't hurt me. Oh, don't hurt me. I've brought your milk, Mr. Wake. 
You're very sweet to think of it, Miss Garth. Now you finish it. Come on, every drop. It's good for you. <laughs> that seems to be your only concern. <laughs> the things that are good for me. <laughs> uh, have you been uh, happy since I've come? These past two months have been wonderful. I've never known anyone as kind or as self-sacrificing as you. And I've never felt so contented. Oh. I want you to know, sir, that... Well, it isn't because you pay me. Of course not. I would never suggest such a thing. It's just that... Well, you have no one else, and I have no one else. We seem to give each other a great deal of strength and understanding. You've even made me forget my affliction. <laughs> even though Flora here keeps reminding me of it. You seem to have such a great affection for that cat, Mr. Wakey. Keep her on your lap almost all the time. Uh, poor Flora is rather handicapped with one eye, and she has a habit of running between people's legs when they walk. Uh, I hold her on my lap to keep her out of mischief. <laughs> you see, she's already caused her quota of trouble uh, with me. With you? A little over a year ago, as I was walking across my room, Flora ran between my feet. I, I tripped and uh, broke my back. You mean she caused your paralysis? Uh, indirectly, uh, yes. And you still keep her? It wasn't Flora's fault that she couldn't see too well. Uh, besides, I have a great capacity for pity and forgiveness, uh, as you do, Miss Miss Mr. Wake. Oh, uh, what is it, Mrs. Wilton? I've been trying to see you alone for quite a while now. But Miss Garth hasn't given me the chance. I'm afraid I don't understand, Mrs. Uh, Wilton. Why are you so nervous, Mrs. Wilton? Uh, what's the trouble? Mr. Wake, I... I'm leaving. Leaving? You mean leaving my employ? Yes. But why? What... Uh... I refuse to stay here with... with that woman. Are you referring to Miss Garth? Oh, I'm sorry that I can't give you notice. I'm going tonight. But if you want to know the reason, I'll tell it to you. Alone. In the library. What is all this, Miss Garth? Oh, Mr. Wake, I, I'm so sorry it had to come up this way. I didn't want to tell you because I, I knew how fond you are of Miss, Mrs. Wiltman. Well, I was almost sure she'd never, never do it again. Do what again? Steal from you. No. I, I've prayed that I wouldn't have to tell you. What has she stolen? How do you know this? That picture of your dead wife was in a solid gold frame. If you remember, Mrs. Wilton told you the picture was missing, that it had been mis misplaced. Well, she stole that picture. For the frame. I can't believe it. She's stolen several other things. Your tie pin, your diamond cufflinks. Oh, you thought you'd lost them, but I knew. Mrs. Wilton realizes that I know, and she's trying to brazen it out. She hopes that you'll get rid of me instead. But, but Harriet Wilton was a trusted friend. How could the she... The thing she stole, Mr. Waker, in her room. I'm sorry to have to do it this way, but your security means more to me than sentiment. And I'm going to prove what I say right now. I'll go to her room. I would like to speak to you alone, Mr. Wake. There'll be no need for an explanation, Mrs. Wilton. What do you mean? I found these in your room. I don't understand. Because of the many years of faithful service you've given me in the past, I won't inform the police. But I want you to take your things and leave this house immediately. She made this up. She did this just to get rid of Mrs. me. Mrs. Wilton. I want you to leave now, without any further discussion. Very well, Mr. Wade. But heaven help you when you're all alone with her. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Garth. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Wade. I've forgiven her, as you have for everything. I'll hire another housekeeper in the morning. That won't be necessary. No... You won't need anyone else from now on, Mr. Wake. But me.
A cat has nine lives, according to the experts. And the four-legged creatures can afford a risk or two. But man has only one, and when he finds that one in jeopardy, each minute becomes more precious than the next, and each hour is spent in staving off his doom. I'm afraid I've become a little worried, Miss Garth. Worried? About what? I... I just hadn't heard from anyone in so long. I used to receive an occasional visit from my friends in the city, but now I... Aren't you lonely, Mr. Wake? With me? Oh, it's not that, Leah. Leah? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, please. I, I've, I've been wanting you to call me Leah ever since I came. Well, <clears throat> you sent those letters I wrote. Yesterday. I don't know why the others were never answered. Perhaps your friends don't want to be bothered. Well, how do you mean? No one is cheered by an invalid. An, an invalid? You've never referred to me that way before. I just want you to know, Jasper, that I'm the only one you can depend on. I'm the only one in the world who really loves you. Leah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I've been holding that back for so long I shouldn't have said it. Leah, you've been a good friend to me and a great help, but uh, I don't want you to go too far in your own imagination. You mean you, you don't share my affection? I admire you greatly, and, and there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you. But love, well, I'm afraid I'm just a little too old for that sort of thing. I see. Uh, oh, please don't be hurt. Oh, no, no, I, I think I understand. Do you know, I've just had an idea. I think we'll have a little party this weekend. A party? I'll invite some friends, uh, old cronies. Uh, it's really been rather dull around the house in the last few weeks. I, I feel the need of a little company. <laughs> Male company, I mean. No reflections on you, my dear. But you've written to your friends and they haven't answered. Uh, lazy cusses. But I'll fool them. I'll call them personally. <laughs> it's odd I didn't think of that before. Uh, may I have that phone, please? Very well. well let's see. Uh, I'll call my attorney first. An excellent fellow, John Hanley. You'll like him. Funny. Operator doesn't answer. Hello? Hello? Jasper. Yeah? The phone is out of order. Out of... Uh, since when? It's been out of order for quite a while now. Why didn't you mention it to me? I didn't think it was necessary. Not necessary. To be without a phone all the way out here? Why, it's our only communication with the outside world. I know. What do you mean, you know? I don't want you to communicate with anyone, Jasper. I want you all to myself. Don't you think you're being a bit silly, Leah? Just you and I, in this lonely house. It's all I've ever wanted, Jasper. Now, look here. Let's stop this nonsense and get that phone fixed. Come along. We'll take the car and drive into town. We'll get a phone mechanic up here in no time at all. What did I do with my car keys? I have them, Jasper. Oh. Well, uh... Leah. Yes? Did you say you mailed those letters I wrote yesterday? Yes. Then what are they doing in my desk? I was going to destroy them after I'd read them. I haven't had the chance to yet. But it doesn't matter. Oh, never mind the letters. If you're taking me into town right now... No, Jasper. I demand that you drive me in, Leah. You're never leaving here, Jasper. And neither am I. <laughs> I'll prepare your dinner. What is it? Why, you haven't finished your dinner, Jasper. I'm not hungry. You've hardly eaten in the past few days. You know, that isn't nice. Leah, for heaven's sake, tell me what this is all about. Why are you keeping me a prisoner here? What have I done to deserve this? I love you, Jasper. I don't believe it. I was hoping one day we'd marry. You must be out of your mind. Do you think for one second that I'd marry you? Is that your game? Are you after my money? Frankly, Jasper, you're making it more difficult for me. I warn you, Leah. I love you so, but you won't reciprocate. Well, perhaps you'll do something else. Perhaps you'll sign this paper for me. 
What's printed on that paper? Your will. And you leave everything to me. My will? Now I know you're crazy. Jasper. Do you think I can't see through your hideous scheme? Do you think I'm a child? Why, you... You may be fiend enough to kill me if I sign that paper. And I'll kill you, Jasper. If you don't... Time moves on relentlessly for Jasper Wake. Like all of us, he cannot stop it, regardless of what the next few minutes hold for him. Where are you taking me, Leah? We're going for a walk in the garden. I hate the garden. I hate everything in it. Why, Jasper? Because I love it so. You'll live and die in this house, Leah, before you get me to sign that will. Oh, you're so stubborn, Jasper. You'll see how stubborn I can be after a while. I don't intend to wait much longer. No? As a matter of fact, I'm giving you just 24 hours to make up your mind. And if I refuse? You won't refuse, Jasper. We'll see about that. Tomorrow at 6, you'll sign that will. Never. Wait a minute. Stop this chair. I intended to stop right here. So, as a last cheap trick, you've destroyed my garden, too. I haven't destroyed it, Jasper. You've been digging holes in it. Just one pitch was all I dug. Look at it closely, Jasper. It's long and it's deep. What does it remind you of? No, no. Yes, Jasper. And I dug it just for you. Don't you intend to eat lunch, Jasper? Get out and leave me alone. Oh, you're so irritable today. Don't play that filthy little beast out. Keep away from her, Leah. You treat that cat as if it was human. Compared to you, it is human. You know, I feel sorry for Flora. Do you? It's unfair to allow a cat like that to suffer. Leah, if you dare lay one finger on Flora. <laughs> one finger would be enough to take care of its other eye. <laughs> You're not a woman. You're a female horror. Get out of my sight. Get out and leave me alone. Yes, it's two o'clock, Jasper. The will is on your desk. I'll be back at six with a fountain pen. time, aren't you? Have you made up your mind? Suppose I sign. Then what? I'll be your devoted slave. As I've always been. For how long? The rest of your life. Do you see what I've placed on that table, Jasper? It's a bottle of chloroform. A few drops on this wad of cotton and you're finished. Do you want this cotton across your face? Will you let me live if I sign that will? A bargain is a bargain. Give me the pen. You're very sweet, Jasper. Flora, Flora, come back. Never mind the cap. There's your paper. Thank you, Jasper. You're, you're going? Not just yet. What are you doing with that bottle? I told you I'd be your devoted slave for the rest of your life. I neglected to mention how short a time that would be. Yeah. I know. You're going to kill me anyway. I thought you might have one shred of pity. But you haven't. Goodbye, Jasper. Leah. And thanks for everything. <laughs> Mr. Wake! Mr. Wake, open up! I'll break the door down, Sheriff. I know something's happened to him. Mr. Wake! Mr. Wake! Mr. Wake! Where are you? 
I'm over here, Mrs. Wilton. Oh, are you okay? Mrs. Wilton here said somebody might be trying to murder you for you. Uh -uh. I've been trying to get you on the phone, Mr. Wake, for days. Then I noticed you never came into town anymore. And, I'm uh, uh, quite all right, Mrs. Wilton. Uh, that woman, where is she? She's wanted by the police. Yes, you were right about her, Mrs. Wilton. Quite right. Where is she? Did she get out? No, she's in the next room, Sheriff. In the next But there's no hurry. She tripped over Flora here when she tried to kill me. She can't escape. She can't even move. She's paralyzed. And that is the story of Jasper Wake, as recorded by the clock. Leah's punishment was well befitting of her crime. A coincidence? Her accident, you mean? Well, now, really, life mirrors a great number of even stranger things. And I happen to know that lightning can strike twice in the same place. I'll prove it to you sometime. If you'll join me in my perch high above that skyscraper I like to cling to. The lofty building near Madison Square. You can see the entire city from that crow's nest, and there's nothing more dramatic in the storm. So join me there some evening, and the two of us can pass a little time. The Clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. The Clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. you if I said I was a rather frivolous fellow? Well, I am. <laughs> oh, I know your answer. You'll say the family heirloom's been ticking away for 60 years and has never lost a second. But I'm a practical joker in other ways, and I'll prove it. For instance, when it's 12 o'clock noon in New York City, it's 5 p.m. in Paris. Really? And when it's 5 p.m. in Paris, everyone in Bombay will insist that it's half past 10. And in Hong Kong, now hold on to your hats, friends. In Hong Kong, it's one in the morning of the following day. <laughs> yes, it's 6 p.m. in the Amsterdam while it's midnight in Singapore, and they're having a late breakfast in Mexico City while they're serving dinner in Bucharest. And it's off to work in Los Angeles while the karaokers are sipping cocktails in Rio de Janeiro. Rio. Beautiful Rio. The loveliest city in all the world. A city where anything can happen and everything does. Please. Very dry. Oh, I speak a little English, madame. Oh, my friend will be along just a moment. Yes, madame. Uh, you are new in Rio, madame. <laughs> Brand new. You like it? Oh, it's marvelous. I'm going to Bilem tomorrow. What's it like in Bilem? Uh, Bilem? Oh, see, see, Bilem is on the Amazon River. Mm, so I've been told. Uh, it is hot in Bilem. Very hot. Many bugs. <laughs> that sounds encouraging. Well, my husband ought to like it. Bugs are his specialty. He's an entomologist. Como? An entomologist. He catches them. He's also an explorer. And a bore. Now hurry up with this, Martin. Don't get touched, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Lisa, there you are. Barry! Where's your thing? I'm so sorry, Henry. How could you be? We have to look at him. He's leaving? Tomorrow. He's taking you with him? Yes, isn't it frightful? So he's taking me up the Amazon as far as the nail. Then he's going into the unexplored territory alone. Yes. At the end of the world. You'll strangle there in the heat. Uh, to Martini, very dry. Uh, thank you. Uh, darling, let's take the drinks over that corner table. There's too many of these people here. Can I stand in there? Mm. Barry, darling, what do we do? 
You can. I can. Nothing to be prepared. Ever since we've met, I've thought of no one else in the world. Daddy, I, I've never loved a man the way I love you. What about Charles? My husband ought to be an idiot. I can't stand him anymore. You know that. Yes, yeah, you're leaving me. What else can I do? If I insist on staying here, he might become suspicious. Yes, yeah, you're right, of course. We have one other choice. One other choice? I'm going to meet you in the nest. We can't risk it, Barry. Why not? Not arrive there after he's gone. I'll leave before he gets back. If he gets back. What do you mean? If he gets back. You realize where that fool husband of yours is going? The headwaters of the Amazon is one of the wildest sections on earth. Larry doesn't get him. The crocodiles might. I think the crocodiles in the south was always the... Uh, Chavantes. The Chavantes? Yes, Indians. You know, they, they, they kill the victims in a very original way. They break their backs. What a revolting idea. Eve, I'm going with you. And you may be coming back alone with me. My dear. Did you get Mrs. Kennedy's in tissue? Kennedy's tissue isn't easy to find here in Manaus, a thousand miles up the Amazon. Good gravy. Isn't it bad enough that I have to sit here in this oven and melt like a lump of butter without you making stupid remarks? I'm about... sorry. Excuse me, Mr. My dear, of course. When are you leaving? For the interior? Yes. I'll leave Manaus in the morning. How long will you be gone? Eight weeks. Perhaps longer. All depends. Uh, isn't it considered to be a very uh, dangerous trip? Oh, exceedingly. I'll worry about you. I've been through this part before, but I'm going even deeper this time. I've been working for over a week on a specially prepared map. I'll be safe as long as I have it with me. Oh, uh, by the way, <laughs> guess who I ran into this afternoon? Who, oh, Charles? That chap we met in Rio two months ago, Barry Crandon. Really? Hmm. I happened to be at the waterfront making final preparations for the boat when his plane arrived. I... Uh, Barry Cranham, oh, uh, I... I don't seem to remember him too well. Oh, you must have... Uh, handsome chap, very, very polished. The one who told us those amusing stories about the beer <laughs> uh, Oh, yes, yes. I was curious as to why he happened to come to this part of the country, so I asked him. What... Uh, what did he say? Uh, he's on a government mission. Something to do with winning over a few of the wilder Indian tribes. He's going into the same general territory that I am, so I invited him along. I see. Mm, interesting, fellow. I expect I'll be seeing a good deal of him the next few weeks. Yes, Charles. I'm sure you will. Barry, can we get him from here? No, I'm not sure we won't follow him. He's asked you to go with him into the jungle. Yes, there's no way I could refuse his invitation either. No one goes into the jungle by himself if he can help it. You were too suspicious. What do we do, darling? There's only one way out. I'll have to go along with him. But uh, I'll return alone. Barry! Do you love me? You know I do. Most of that chance. You mean you're going to... Who knows the difference? We're ambushed by the Indians. I get away. They'll send a military expedition into the jungle and find him. But uh, they'll find him dead. I... I never thought... If you don't have the nerve, this is the time to say so. I'll leave when I ask the next plane. We'll never see each other again. Oh, no, Barry. I, I couldn't tell it if you did. It's all there waiting for us. If we have the nerve. I suppose divorcing you would never be enough. Darling, divorce me. Your husband has one thing we need. One thing we haven't got. Money? Well, I'd take you as you are. If you could live on what I got. But the earn and wrap of you. We have to go up for auction. We might have... No, I'm not giving up the money, Barry. That's why I married him. And the things his money can buy are still as important to me as ever. I'm not asking you to give it up. I'm only asking you to share it with me. All right, Barry. Your way is the best way. But you're not going to do it alone. Not alone? Well, what do you mean? He'll take me with him, if I ask him. Good morning, Charles. Ah, oh, good morning, Mary. Is Mrs. Clifford awake yet? No, she's still asleep, poor thing. <laughs> this heat is beginning to annoy her. Well, it's not doing my disposition any good either. <laughs> I'll let her sleep as late as she can. 
We're going to land in a couple of hours, and she'll need all her energy for the trip ahead. We're going to land? The native boatmen won't go any further. Now, worried about the Indians. Oh, I don't blame them. Uh, these savages are pretty rough. No, I don't understand. They're rather nervy to try to contact me. Oh, I had experience with Indians before, in Bolivia, Ecuador. <laughs> well, they gave me the job, even though I am an American. Oh, I see. Hey, Charles, have you ever seen a shrunken head? Oh, mm, yes, one. Very odd-looking thing, don't they? Fancy going in for a hobby like that. Well, they don't practice head shrinking here in Brazil, I want. <laughs> no. But the jungle is full of Chavantes. They're backbreakers, you know. Yes, so I've heard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm familiar with the Indian types, but I don't know as much about the jungle up here as you do. Well, it's practically impossible to find your way around without a map and a compass. Yes, that's true. And if you go too deep, even they won't help you. All in charter, eh? Exactly. They say that no one has ever come out of the interior alive. <laughs> of course, I don't expect to go that far in for my specimens. But what makes you risk your life if you bug, Charles? Oh, you see, I'm a scientist and a bit of an explorer. It's my work. Even though I don't make very much of a living by it. No, well, when a man inherits money, of course. I he say, how did you know I inherited my money? Uh, didn't you mention that one? Oh, well, perhaps. I don't remember. Well, it's anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, incidentally, uh, do you only carry one copy of that map you made? Yes. Uh, well, I, I wonder if you do me a favor. Could, could you make me a copy, too? Oh, I think may separate for a while. I... I'd like to be able to find my way back. Well, there's no need for us to separate, but uh, I'll make some copy of the map if, if, if you wish. Oh, thanks, Michael. Uh, the boatman will wait for us on the riverbank some 15 miles from here. Mm. We'll take enough supplies to last four days. Then we can return, replenish our stores, and start out again in another direction. Oh, that's fine. If and when I manage to make contact with the Indians, uh, let me handle it. Oh, naturally, old boy. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Why, it's early noon. Uh, I'm afraid I overslept. Oh, would you give me some coffee, Charles? I'll have one of them in brew a fresh pot. Uh, excuse me. No, certainly. Good great. Look at that jungle. We're landing in an hour or two. We're we'll pushing into the jungle for a day or so. And... Don't talk that. It makes me nervous. It's so ridiculous. The fool's giving me a copy of his map. It saves me the trouble of stealing the original. I'll get hold of his compass, of course, afterwards. I wish I could over with it. It will be very shortly. The boatman will stay in the river. When we return, we'll tell them we were ambushed and we'll go back to Manaus. How, how will you kill him? Well, I can't use a gun, but I might find his body. There's only one really safe way. Eve, I'm going to take a point from the Indians and break his back. <laughs> the hour of day, the years also vary in different parts of the world. It's the second half of the 20th century in New York and London, but in certain parts of Tibet it may be the middle of the 17th century. And even this is a modern era compared to the jungles of Brazil. For the headwaters of the Amazon is one of the few places in the world where time has never existed. Things remain as they were thousands of years ago, and the life that swarms and crawls over everything provides a fitting symphony to the exhausting and terrifying heat. to hack our way through from here with machetes, Barry. Uh, you sure you know where we are? Do you have your mat handy? Yes, right here. Yeah. Oh, I'm dry. Now, we're over here, some 20 miles from the river. Yeah. By following the map due south from here, we're only a day's march from the boat. I see. Yeah. Just want to make certain we're sticking to a course. Charles, mm. when will we stop? Go on a little farther, Eve. Make camp for the night. I'll go on ahead and you can follow single fire, eh? Sorry. Yes, I have a feeling he's beginning to sense that something's wrong. For heaven's sake, get it over with. It made us horrible, baby. Now, look, uh, I'll have to wait until tonight. I'm just asleep. Just a few more hours, even more free. Be patient. Time will be right very shortly.
Так.
monkeys are those crazy monkeys. I could strangle them. Daddy, I, I can't go on. Oh, Mr. Henry, I'm All right, all right. Oh, you're thirsty. You're thirsty. How do you think I feel? You look the way you feel. You look like a washed out rat. Really? I wouldn't talk, I mean, you. It's too bad you haven't got a mirror. What do you mean? You have the makeup face and the fancy lipstick. You're not exactly a beauty color to yourself. Look at you. Look at you. Filthy and fart. Don't you don't. Don't you talk to me like that. Sorry, I never came with you. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm late. I don't you. Hateful to you. You're hateful. What a chump. I turned out of there. Is that it? Instead of sitting in a comfortable hotel in Rio, I had to chase all the way up here after you. You won't have to chase me any longer when we get out of this jungle. The pleasure will be all mine. There. There's a stream over there. Water. Okay, there's a water. Wait. Maybe we can take a chance and boil some. Come on. Water. Steve? Two hours ago. Oh, my yes, God. it is. I remember that rock bus. Look, some uh, footprints in that. The big guy ran in circles, Barry. Where's that map? Put it inside the map. Oh, What's that? When I, I, What's that? Uh, I don't know. It's like some kind of a diary or something. Oh, I remember map. the child's log book. Scoops it up with some of the camp stuff. And I went to the heck. Here's the map, Barry. I was looking at it. Look. Listen, listen. Today, and I knew for certain that my wife was in love with Barry Cranston. That's the planning to murder me. I'm not sure. Barry. However, I'm making a few plans of my own just in case. I am killed. I have to, I have to follow the map I made for Barry and made to. Oh, no, no, no. They'll find themselves going around in circles. They'll have a count of the jungle alive. Come back. Come back. <laughs> Don't run circles. You can't move the spot. Set and run right into those carriages. Trace your steps. We'll run the other way. No. Deeper into the jungle. We've got to do something. We can't stay here. Here comes that night, too. Come closer. Around it. I don't want to die. Excuse me. I don't want to die. Before, before they kill you, they bring you. Once I saw a picture brought back from the jungle of a, a victim. It was, it was the most horrible thing I'd ever seen. No, 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 no. Willis Smith, Miss Gunn. You want to share them with me? No, I'm sure. No. All right. Go on, Get it out with you, please. All right. I am. Uh, I can't kill myself. I can't. Oh, neither can I. I've wanted to take a shot at those monkeys. You're crazy. It's gone out of your mind. Don't worry. Just sit down. Just sit down. Yeah, just sit down and wait. Very sir. Oh, it's very sir. Hi. <laughs> but they'll be here. Don't hold. Don't worry. They'll be here all night. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Them? When they come? will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Lawrence Flea is the author, and you heard Hart McGuire as the clock. As Even Barry, you heard Lynn Murphy and Joe McCormick, and as Charles and the bartender, Frank Waters and Al Garcia. 
The Clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. <laughs>